Why did you want to be an astronaut? When I was three years old, I remember watching people walk on the moon. And I knew right then and there that's something I wanted to do. So what NASA does is to inspire the next generation of explorers. And I'm, I'm living proof. And this happens all the time. We have such a captivating mission and, and what we're doing. And people around the planet know who NASA is, who we are, and what we do. And uh, it's great to be part of that team. And I was really uh, thrilled to know that there was room for me at NASA. And I'm hoping to be able to, to say to everyone out there that, hey, there's, there's room for you at NASA. You've got to study hard, work hard, and, uh, and hopefully what we're doing now inspires even the next generation of explorers. Well, let's use your story as an example here. Start by telling me about your hometown and what it was like for you growing up around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, finest city on the planet Earth. And uh, it's a great place to grow up. Uh, the people work hard and uh, value education. Uh, there's uh, so many cultural and educational resources in the city. And uh, I was the oldest of nine kids. We didn't have a lot of money, but we're still able to spend time in planetariums and the museums and, and the science centers that uh, are all over the city. Uh, had a um, benefit and blessing to be able to, to, to go to uh, a private high school. I had to work on the weekends to make it happen, but uh, the school made it work too. And I had a great, excellent edu education in high school, studying science and math and all the things that really excited me, as well as English and language. Turns out that those are, those are important too. And uh, so I, I was able through Air Force ROTC scholarship attend MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where we really started to get into rockets and airplanes, and I couldn't have been more happier and then the jobs that I've had in the Air Force, you know, flying in, in uh, high performance airplanes, attending the Air Force Test Pilot School as an engineer, and then uh, getting to go to, you know, work here at NASA. I mean, it's been one dream job after another. It sounds like you have a, a pretty strong feeling that the people and the place where you grew up were instrumental in making you the person you are. I was the uh, oldest of nine kids. My parents uh, worked very hard to make sure that, uh, that we had the best education possible and I'm always very thankful to my parents and my grandparents as well as my friends and family along the way and uh, then there's always the, the special teachers, the mentors that we, uh, we've all had that we remember and uh, so my goal now is to be that kind of person and help the, you know, the, the people that uh, come after me to be as good of a mentor or or to give encouragement, uh, be an inspiration, and that's how I can pay back those those, those teachers that uh, had patience, and boy, they had a lot of patience with me. <laughs> Do you get it? Uh, you must have had a, a good chance to see the area from space. Oh my goodness! Being up there for a year. <laughs> yeah, we would uh, fly over, and I try to catch a, a view of the a Pirates game or a Steelers game uh, in, in the new stadiums that we have. But uh, I was able to take some really nice uh, photos of the area. It's kind of tough finding any particular spot on the planet when you're traveling 17,500 miles an hour. But uh, if you've been up there for a while, like we were on the International Space Station, you get to know our planet pretty well and know some of the tricks. So we would be screaming in, coming from the north to the south over Lake Erie, and I could find Interstate 79, I-79, and find the three rivers in the greater International Airport, Pittsburgh International Airport, click, click. So I was even able to see my dad's house, my mom, my mom and dad's house from space. And uh, so that's one of my, my treasured photos. Uh, you, you mentioned that you went to a, a private high school in Pittsburgh and from there uh, out uh, into the world. Uh, tell, fill in the details on that. Tell me about your education and your professional course that led you to becoming an astronaut. Yeah, so, and, and I, sh I, I try to share this with kids. It's like find something you like and then just go for it and be the best at it because you know, I really enjoyed rockets and airplanes. That's all I could think about. And uh, so I wanted to go to this uh, high school because they had a good science program and maybe they'll teach me about rockets and airplanes. Well, they didn't teach me so much about rockets and airplanes, but the fundamentals that I needed to have, like was this algebra and calculus and all those things. And once I got those, then all of a sudden I could understand the rocket equation and go from there. And, and as well as other things that turns out to be really important in my life, uh, that 
for example, the fundamentals of language. How do we speak English and what are the parts of a sentence? Well, why do I need to know that for rockets and airplanes? Well, because I understood language and because I had a strong background uh, for languages, even though I didn't uh, do very well on my grades, uh, but by taking that background, that, fundam that fundament is really important because uh, you know, five years of Latin helped me understand Russian. And because I understood Russian, the, my first opportunities to fly in space were with the Russians aboard the Soyuz spacecraft because it turns out that language is really important in, in the ability to communicate. So boy, that was something that wasn't right in my mind of rockets and airplanes directly, but I learned Russian so I could talk about the Russian rockets and Russian airplanes, and uh, that was my, my in uh, to for, for NASA. So whatever academics you have, you gotta really you know, do your best at and learn the most because the more you know, the more opportunity you have and the more opportunity to do the things that you, that you like. So I studied really hard, tried my best to get good grades, and I'll tell you what, I got, I got a couple D's in there and a C once and things like that. So it's not like I've always been perfect, uh, but it's along the way that uh, when you learn your, to learn from your mistakes and learn how to rise above it, that gives you some really good lessons in life because nobody has the, the perfect smooth life. It's how we handle defeat sometimes that define us. Well, that got you ready for the next step. Take us through those next steps on to college and the Air Force. All right, so uh, I needed to go to college. I wanted to go to college, study rockets and airplanes. So I looked through the course catalogs and there's a couple colleges that, that fit, the, fit the bill. And then, but I had to figure out how to pay for it because I didn't have any money. And the Air Force was offering a scholarship, scholarships at the time, saying, hey, four years of college, and we'll, you've served with us for four years, and you have a job as soon as you get out, and uh, we'll, we'll pay for your college. You have to come up with room and board. And I said, fine, I can flip hamburgers for room and board. And, uh, and uh, the Air Force paid my tuition, and boy, it was, it was amazing, because I got to study about rockets and airplanes and, and uh, planetary science in there, too, because that was a lot of fun. But Air Force paid for that, and I was. A, but they also gave me leadership training, and a, a job when I got out, and uh, so I went off to pilot training, right away from the Air Force, from the from college, and it turns out after six or seven months, uh, the Air Force and I both agreed that I wasn't going to be the God's gift to to <laughs> aviation that I thought I was going to be, and I uh, wasn't destined to become a fighter pilot. So I washed out of pilot training. Can you imagine how? disappointing that was. It was on my birthday too. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we picked up the pieces and uh, I asked the Air Force, well fine, try to make me an engineer. So I went and started working on uh, spacecraft engineering in Los Angeles and uh, that w just as bad as I was as a, as a potential fighter pilot, it turns out that perhaps I was that good as, a, as an engineer and I found my, my niche and what I was able to do and uh, the Air Force agreed and they said, well you're pretty good at this engineering stuff. So why don't you become a flight test engineer, help us fly t and test new airplanes. And so I was able to do that for a while um, as a student at the Air Force Test Pilot School. And uh, so that was amazing. I mean, I knew I was in the right place because you know I like rockets and airplanes. They said, all right, your job today is to come up with a plan. We're gonna give you an F-16 fully loaded with uh, gas, uh, a front seater, guys sit in the front to take off and land. You get to do everything else. That was my job for the day, was to go fly an F-16, go supersonic, go low level, and uh, to put the airplane through its paces and understand what it is to fly in a high performance fighter so that I could be a better engineer in testing out the F-16. I mean, so I knew I was in the right spot. I mean, how many kids who are you know, 22, 23 years old get a chance to do that? So that was, uh, that was amazing uh, uh, step. And so we were testing new airplanes. Um, I was testing F-16s and, and new, uh, and new things that went on to F-16s, new radar systems and things like that. And then the Japanese were building a version of F-16. Well, this, this ability to communicate in other languages came to play, and the Air Force said, wait a second, you test F-16s and you speak Japanese? So uh, they sent me over to Japan, and uh, it was uh, working with our Japanese partners in the F-2 program over there, uh, flying you know, for first test flights of a brand new airplane, uh, across the planet, you know, somewhere on the other halfway around the world it was really exciting. Uh, at that point, NASA said, hey, why don't you come work with us and go fly in the space shuttle? So uh, now and then I reflect on my birthday that happened when I got washed out of pilot training, and I think it was for the best. You ended up in a job where 
not unlike maybe some of your previous jobs, where there's a, a certain element of danger to what you're doing that is not, uh, not there for most people. Mike, what is it that you feel that is that we get as a result of flying people in space that makes it worth taking that risk? You know, it's only recently uh, since I've had children of my own that I realized that this what I've been doing is dangerous. I mean, I, I understood it, but maybe not uh, inside. And uh, um, I would tell my mom, for example, about some of the things I was doing because I thought it was fun. She says, oh, that's so dangerous. And I said, really? <laughs> so... Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, she would she would become more nervous about it than than I was, and uh, now I kind of understand that, and I understand that what we do is 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 a big risk, and it not, wouldn't just affect us, but our families, our loved ones, um, and the and our whole team if something uh, bad were to happen. But you know what? What this danger, this risk that we're taking has high benefits, high payoffs. Already, you know, the technology that we have here with our little smartphones and everything like that and personal computers and, and wireless internet and all these things that we, that we worry about now, all of that technology really came when we invested in our space program and when we had to miniaturize our electronics. And uh, this is providing a strong engine for our economy. It's making life and productivity and uh, better on planet Earth. Uh, my children have a farther, a longer range of educational opportunities from the internet and from educational TV shows that we're able to record on a DVR at home. Heck, even 10 years ago, we wouldn't even know what DVR was. All this technology has a basis so that in the space program. So these risks that we're taking is making life on planet Earth better. And, uh, and we're going to continue doing this in the countries like the United States that take this risk are going to benefit the most. Mike, you're a member of the crew of STS-134, first time on a shuttle flight. Summarize the goals of this mission and tell me what you're going to be doing on the mission. Absolutely. Uh, I've been here f at NASA for 14 years. I've spent a year in space, but I've never launched on or landed on a space shuttle before. So it was uh, with great surprise and uh, pleasure that I got assigned to STS-134, commanded by Mark Kelly, and uh, we've got a really great crew. My job on the, on the mission is to be, uh, first and foremost, MS-1. What does MS-1 mean? Mission specialist number one. I sit up on the flight deck in the cockpit and help uh, with launching and landing of this complex aerospace vehicle. It's really amazing what the sh shuttle can do. So I like to think that some of the skills that I learned in flying as a flight engineer in the Soyuz, I'm helping uh, my shuttle friends uh, work on. I'm also privileged to be a spacewalker on this mission. Um, EV2, so we have uh, Drew Foistel as our lead spacewalker. Um, uh, I'm right after him. And we have uh, Greg Shamatov, who I flew with on Expedition 18. And the three of us are going to uh, perform four spacewalks on STS-134. You've got cargo to deliver to the station too, right? It's a very important mission uh, in terms of science. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer is uh, going to sit on the outside of the International Space Station and collect some amazing data. So we get to carry the AMS, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, up into space. We pick it up with a robot arm, hand it off to the station robot arm, and dock it and sit it on top of the International Space Station. Then it's going to look up to the heavens and just receive whatever super particles uh, decide to arrive. And what we're going to be able to detect some things that we've never seen before and understand the universe a lot better thanks to AMS. Almost everyone on this crew has been to this space station before. And uh, you and Greg Shamatoff have both done long duration missions. You've commanded this space station before. I mean, how does that kind of experience benefit this crew as you get ready to, to fly this mission? It, it's, it's definitely a privilege uh, to fly with people with a lot of uh, different experience. And uh, together, it's, we have a really strong team. And uh, we have a lot to do in a short amount of time. So having everybody up uh, on their level of experience, up on their abilities to uh, handle space flight is really going to help us uh, ensure success for this mission. Having completed two long-term missions on the station, what are your expectations as you think about making a short visit this time? Well, it's. Uh, it's definitely a different life 
uh, flying aboard a, a space shuttle. And one of the biggest differences, though, is that uh, we're in it for the sprint. Uh, we used to say the space station missions are more like a marathon. You know, pace ourselves for six months, uh, get a lot done, but uh, don't burn yourself out because you know, six months in space is a long time. And I saw that twice. But for the space shuttle mission, we only have 12, 13 days to get everything done, and there's a lot on our plates. So every minute is accounted for, and uh, we're going to be busy. We won't have time to stop and smell the roses, get weekends off, and things like that, like we do aboard the International Space Station. It's going to be very exciting, going to be very busy, and I'm really glad that my colleagues all have had uh, experience before, so they know what, uh, what to expect. When you're up in space, your body behaves differently. Uh, you, you might get space sick for the first couple of days. Well, we all know where we stand with that, and uh, we'll be able to hit the ground running or floating. Yeah. Now, the station is going to be a little different than when you left it, too, right? Well, I think the biggest difference, two biggest differences for me are, uh, first, uh, there's going to be six people aboard the space station. Uh, my crew, Expedition 18, we were the last three-person crew. Now, now there's six people aboard the space station, and I'm really proud of that, but it'd be great to see it. But we'll also be able to see outside a lot better with the cupola on Node 3 and uh, looking out above our... our planet Earth uh, with a full panoramic high definition video. Well, that's not video, isn't it? It's the real thing. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's going to be a real treat. And I think that's where if uh, Mark Kelly needs to find me somewhere, that's I think he'll, he'll know exactly where to head. Let's talk a little bit more about the, what you're bringing up to the space station, what you're delivering to the space station. You've got the Express Logistics Carrier 3. Tell me about what that is and what it's going to do. Well, it has one of the most exciting names in the business, Express Logistics Carrier Number 3. Uh, but it's really uh, important for the space station. We have, obviously, by, by its name, we have other Express Logistics Carriers. And what we're doing is setting up the space station to last until 2020 and perhaps beyond. So in order for a large aerospace complex vehicle like the International Space Station to last a long time without a heavy lift vehicle like the shuttle to deliver spares, spare parts, because things do break out over time. We have all the spare parts of the station already bolted onto the outside of this big frame structure. And then our job, in fact, it's one of my jobs as a robotic arm operator, is to take the Express Logistics Carrier number three, ELC-3, out of the payload bay, hand it off to the station arm, and then it gets docked onto the outside of the International Space Station and it's going to just stay there. It has power and data so we can keep tr keep track of all the things on the outside of it but just say something breaks on the International Space Station we'll be able to with a combination of robotics and extravehicular activity spacewalks we'll be able to uh, fix whatever breaks on board the International Space Station. So we got all of our spares sitting on our back porch outside. Is that a as in comparatively speaking is that a, a complicated robotics task for you to uh, for the, to hand this off to another robotic arm? Well, uh, for me, robotics is always tough. But uh, no, actually, the task itself, uh, thanks to our great uh, robotics team here on the ground, uh, is going to be relatively easy. easy. Uh, the trick is that we have to thread the needle uh, between the sides of the payload bay. Uh, we have the docking structure in front of us, the multi-billion dollar alpha magnetic spectrometer behind us. So the tolerances are really tight. It's, uh, so we're going to be kind of a glorified crane operator picking up the uh, ELC number three and uh, handing it off, but we, we, can't, we don't have very much room for error. You're, we've talked a, been a minute ago about the AMS. I'd like to get you to give us some more details. What does the alpha magnetic spectrometer do when it gets installed up on the starboard side of the truss? The alpha magnetic spectrometer, it's uh, really amazing. It was made by the same team. It's an international collaboration uh, all over the world. I mean, it's a planetary group of scientists that are really trying to understand the universe around us. Uh, this group uh, is kind of stationed at uh, CERN, which is um, uh, the Center for European Research for Particle Physics, and, but it's, it's even beyond Europe. And uh, those guys are really uh, experts at uh, making particle detectors. So the alpha magnetic spectrometer actually is a series. Uh, it's well, it's a it's a an incredible puzzle how they put it all together of six or seven detectors that can detect different things about 
particles that are traveling close to the speed of light. Some of them have a charge, so you have the magnetic part that can trap them, trap them or at least uh, deflect them enough. And by how much they deflect, you can tell how big they are and what they're made out of. And, uh, but some are not charged. I mean, they have no charge, so the magnet part won't affect them. And yet we'll be able to detect uh, particles that are going so fast and have so much energy or so much mass, maybe even anti-particles such as uh, antimatter. We'll be able to detect little, little pieces that are going super, super fast and learn more about the universe. As it turns out, we only know about 15% of what the universe is made of. There's 85 that percent of the entire universe we don't know. Now, 100 years ago, scientists were saying, oh, we know everything. We, we, you know, we just, now the next 100 years of physics, we're just going to be you know, sharpening our, our pencils for the last decimal point. Now, the particle physics and, and, and physics in general are really, uh, really flabbergasted. They are very frustrated on how much they don't know. And yet, the more we know about the physical world around us, the better, better it makes life here on planet Earth. The guys that, you know, Benjamin Franklin out there with his kite and finding out about electricity. In the 18th century, we understood, started to understand electricity. Now, you know, all of our houses have electricity. We take that for granted. Made life better. And that happened just in my grandparents' lifetime. And then uh, in the early uh, uh, 20th century, we decided, we learned about this thing called uh, an atom and, and the nucleus. And now we have nuclear energy, which helps uh, make life on our planet better by uh, giving us a, a source of, of, of power. Who knows what AMS is going to decide, or what's going to, what it's, who knows what the AMS is going to find. What is it looking, is it looking for anything in particular, or just to characterize whatever happens by? Whatever happens by. Because you don't, we don't even know what's out there. We know some of the stuff, but there's other stuff that we don't know. We spent, uh, we as humans, uh, mainly the, the folks at CERN in Europe, have, uh, have this huge atomic collider and they're they're spinning, you know, they're spinning charged particles in a big circle and putting them together and seeing what comes out. And they've got some really high energies, and and uh, but the energies that they're making, is, and which is, you know, world record uh, and 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 really amazing, is nothing to compare what happens when you cl clash a neutron star into a white dwarf or two galaxies colliding. So those kind of things we can't even re replicate on planet Earth. And there's no way we can. But, you know, it's happening out there in the cosmos. And we'll have now an instrument for particle physics to be able to look and peer and, and learn more about our universe. I, I've read that they're looking for data to help understand the origins of the universe. I think that, is that a fair way to characterize the significance of what's happening here? That's only one of the aspects. Uh, not just the origins of the universe, but what the universe is even made out of. We have this whole quandary now in particle physics of this dark matter and this stuff called even dark energy. We have a name for it, but we have no idea what it is. This will help us understand, the alpha magnetic spectrometer will help us understand all of that better. The mechanics of it, how does it get out of the payload bay and up where it needs to go to do the work? Well, I, I have to really commend the engineers and the, the scientific teams that have put together uh, uh, about as plug and play as you can get. Uh, once the alpha magnetic spectrometer uh, launches with us in the payload bay, a few minutes after we get into orbit, I have the privilege of, of uh, opening up a laptop and, and uh, connecting, it, you know, connecting it, turning it on for the first time in space. And then, uh, and then by when we dock to the International Space Station, so we'll, we'll take care of it for four or five days aboard Endeavour. And then once we dock with the International Space Station, my colleagues will reach in with the robot arm, the shuttle robot arm, and just like we did with the LC-3, lift it out of the payload bay, stick it out into space, then the station robot arm will come and grab it and put it on the out, outboard truss, the International Space Station, and uh, the station it was, was designed with uh, universal adapters, so it has a little claw that grabs, pulls it in, and then uh, electrical and data connectors come right up and connect and it's plug and play ready to go. It have power and data and, and uh, that's what made the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer possible. They could not have built a spacecraft unless it was the space station large enough to support the power and data needs that the AMS has uh, just to detect all the things that it does. But yet it's just another payload for the International 
space station, which is so big and large, and it provides uh, space station will provide even more science for life on planet Earth. You mentioned a moment ago that the plan for this mission calls for four spacewalks. They're going to be conducted by three different pairs of spacewalkers, and you're involved in that. Um, what is your role on the team as, as it relates to all four of these EVAs? Yeah, I really liked how uh, Commander Kelly put put uh, the team together and uh, how he built off of all of our strengths and uh, and uh, the things that we don't do so well. So uh, we have a, a, a amazing spacewalking team. There's only three of us, and uh, and yet there's four EVAs, and each EVA, each spacewalk requires two people. So the person who isn't outside doing the spacewalk is actually inside uh, kind of uh, running the spacewalk managing the timeline, reading the procedures, looking ahead to see uh, what to do in case of a contingency, and managing the timeline. When we go out, especially for American spacewalks, we don't have the procedure in front of us. We have a lot memorized, but we don't know everything, and, uh, and we don't have our, our wristwatch to know how much time we have left. And then, uh, and then so the person inside uh, coordinates all of that and works closely with our, our wonderful EVA team on the ground. And, and together, uh, all of us work together to accomplish the mission. And I'm very impressed with the uh, complexity of shuttle-based spacewalks. Uh, we have a lot of time as a shuttle crew to really get ready for, for some spacewalks. We're practicing nine or 10 times in the pool for each spacewalk that we, that we perform. For, as a station guy, as a former station guy, each spacewalk we had maybe one or two practices in the uh, in the pool, and then we went out and did it. And uh, now it's uh, and and the, they weren't as complex or as difficult as the spacewalks we have uh, for the shuttle based. And uh, so it's 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 definitely I think a higher, the next level of uh, of, of focus. And we we've learned that through the shuttle program over time. So on the first spacewalk, I get to be the IV internal. Uh, in vehicle, I guess. Intravehicular. Intravehicular. So I get to be inside the and and help uh, help uh, Andrew Foistel, Drew Foistel, and Greg Shamatov uh, to go out and work on our first EVA. That's Greg's first EVA, by the way, and uh, ever. And Drew had some time on the Hubble Space Telescope, and I had you know six spacewalks on the from the International Space Station. So this is uh, Greg's first spacewalk, and I I promised him even when we were flying together on Expedition 18, it's like I love to be there for the first time you get to go out. <laughs> we never knew that he was going to actually have that chance, so I can't wait to give him a welcoming speech. So, Wait, so let me interrupt yes. you for a second because as you mentioned, you've got spacewalking experience. You did six of them but they were all in Russian spacesuits, Alpha, the International Space Station. It, as you look toward doing them now in the American spacesuit, what, what's the big difference that you, that you foresee? Well, I, I definitely um, am privileged to have a chance to, to be in the Russian Orlan spacesuit and have had a chance to, to perform sp six spacewalks. I never thought I was gonna get one spacewalk ever, much less six in a Russian suit. But the, the amazing uh, part of it is that the Orlan is, is, is very um, robust. It's very capable. And the Russians have been working with uh, Orlans, uh, versions of Orlan, uh, since the 1970s. And so it's a, it's a very trusted and veteran spacesuit. It runs on the inside, uh, though, when you pressurize, about six pounds per square inch. The American spacesuit is called the extravehicular mobility unit. Mobility is the key word for me with the American spacesuit. When I put on the American spacesuit, it's only running about four pounds per square inch, and all of a sudden, I got a lot more mobility. The gloves, the American gloves, are handcrafted by uh, by our team from the East Coast, and they they fit like a glove. The Russians are pretty much size one or size two disposable gloves. These uh, American gloves, they cost more, but they give us uh, so much more ability to manipulate things. So when we're building the complex parts of the space station, we needed an EMU, whereas the Orlan is good for routine maintenance on the outside where you don't need to have such dexterity. So it's a, each suit has its role, each suit has its uh, benefits, but now I get to get a chance to be in an American suit uh, to go outside. Well, as you say, for the first spacewalk, you're going to be inside uh, helping Greg and Drew as they work. Describe what's on the schedule for EVA number one. Yes, uh, one of our highest mission priorities is to uh, 
is to set up, to retrieve and set up uh, new versions of uh, an experiment called MISI, which is a materials experiment aboard the International Space Station. Uh, in the past, uh, you might recall, NASA, uh, along with you know, our, our, our industry partners, have been able to uh, put materials out into space and to test new materials and new computer chips and things like that to see how they would handle space flight and the uh, radiation environment as well as you know what's going on in the high temperatures, cold temperatures. And uh, we had the long duration exposure facility back in the early part of shuttle days. And uh, so these missies have been really able to, uh, with the space shuttle, by sticking on them out on the International Space Station, really low cost but high benefit. Uh, the industry has been able to make better satellites and better materials on, you know, for the satellites for all the way from solar arrays to the paint that they use on the outside of satellites. So it's helped our industry a lot, a lot by understanding how materials and uh, behave in the in the space environment. So we're going to take Missy number seven uh, home. There's two of them, seven uh, A and seven B. They're big suitcases like this. They're they fold open and close like a book, and uh, Greg and Andrew are going to put them off on their uh, body restraint tether, a BRT on the side, and go back to the shuttle payload bay and put them on the outside of the payload bay. So we're actually bringing cargo home, and scientific experiments home. And then we're going to take out uh, two new missies, missie number eight, uh, which is a regular sized missie. Then we have a smaller one uh, that doesn't require any electrical power. Um, it's called mini missie. And uh, we're going to, crew's going to put uh, Mini Missy in, and uh, as well as uh, Missy number eight, and we're going to continue on with that, that uh, round of experiments. So when they finish then with the Missy exchange, their next task is to get ready for the second spacewalk, right? Right. The second spacewalk, we're going to charge our ammonia lines for the International Space Station, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we're going to do some setup tasks, get uh, get a few jumpers ready. And then we're actually going to upgrade our wireless communication system aboard the International Space Station. One of the things when we were designing the space station, we, uh, we had no idea what was to come in the future of wireless communications. And uh, now we're able to communicate with all of our payloads that are on the outside of the space station wirelessly. And this saves us mass and energy and things like that, just like most people at home have a wireless network. And we certainly do here at NASA. So on the outboard of the space station, we have to add uh, some more antennas uh, for our wireless uh, network system so we can talk to things such as the payloads aboard ELC number three. So uh, Drew and uh, Greg are going to open up uh, a few panels on the lab from the outside and uh, connect some, some wires, run, run the cables up to the antennas, connect new antennas on the outside of handrails. And that's going to take a couple hours to uh, do something like that that's relatively routine maintenance, but it has a big impact on the, on the space station communications. And when it comes time for the second spacewalk, a couple of days later, you're going to swap spots with Greg, and you're going outside with Drew. So what are, what are the jobs for you and Drew Feustel when you go out on EVA number two? Yes, building on the success of uh, EVA one, we hope, uh, we're going to go out and uh, we have uh, two main uh, jobs for EVA number two. And both of them are for the long duration maintenance of the International Space Station. Since we're the last shuttle-based EVA, we're doing things in advance for routine preventative maintenance, just like with our automobiles. So while Drew is uh, working mainly with uh, charging our ammonia system, and this isn't the, your household, um, household cleaner ammonia, this is uh, you know, high-grade in industrial ammonia, so we have to be super careful uh, not to get it on us or to spill it, uh, because it's, it's quite dangerous if we brought it back inside. But uh, we're going to recharge the ammonia lines uh, for our air conditioning. It's not internal air conditioning, but mainly it's the external thermal control loop. And uh, so we have a small leak in there that's been known for a long time. It, just like any car, you have to recharge your air conditioning you know, system every couple years. Well, we won't have the shuttle in a couple years, so we're, uh, we're preemptively going to charge up, uh, fully charge up our ammonia system while we can, because there's a series of jumpers that we have to go across, including the rotating uh, solar alpha rotary joint. So we have some jumpers which connecting two lines. So we have a series of hoses that will fully charge our ammonia system. While Drew is doing that, I get to do uh, uh, a lubrication job. So uh, add some uh, add some grease 
to break out to our solar alpha rotary joint, which we found uh, the original design uh, had some had some extra friction that we weren't expecting, and it started to grind our joint. So we've uh, since then, have every couple years, started to add some uh, some grease on it, and it rotates great. However, we won't uh, have that ability so much in the future. So while Drew's working with the ammonia system, I'll be lubricating the outside of the solar alpha rotary joint, so it can last uh, you know the five, ten years, no problem. That's going to get you out on a part of the station where you haven't been before. Absolutely not, and uh, all of these, you know, uh, all of the, our work on EVA2 is very far out on the uh, port truss, so uh, it's a long way to get there and a long way back, but the view is going to be amazing. For uh, EVA3, you and Drew are going to be uh, trying out a new uh, protocol for the pre-breathe that's designed to help purge nitrogen from your bloodstreams before the spacewalk begins. Uh, describe a little bit about what this new procedure is going to be. Yes, uh, when as I mentioned earlier, the American spacesuit runs at roughly uh, a pressure inside of four pounds per square inch. Normal atmospheric pressure here on planet Earth is about 14.7 pounds per square inch, so we're running at a lower pressure, but it's pure oxygen. So uh, like most deep sea divers, we have to be careful as we go from a, a higher pressure to a lower pressure and back uh, so that uh, the, the nitrogen that's in our bloodstream doesn't uh, bubble off like a can of soda pop when you open it up. The bubbles come everywhere. That, that would give us uh, the bends. So in order to avoid the bends uh, from running a, a, a suit at four pounds per square inch, we have a pre-breathe protocol where we breathe oxygen for, for, for a period of time. Well, we've gotten smart about this. It used to be that we would have to just stay in our suit, mind our own business, and sit there for four hours breathing pure, pure, pure oxygen. That was the old old kind of protocol. Then we realized that we can actually take, uh, if we did this work in an environment that was uh, that was at, a, at a high, like a higher altitude, so to speak, or less uh, less air, so less pressure of air, air pressure, uh, like a 10.1 pounds per square inch instead of 14.7, that would make our pre-breathe time in the suit less. Well, now we're even smarter, saying, well, if you actually exercise while you're on pure oxygen. You can, uh, you can even have a smaller pre-breathe time. And now we're taking it even to another level for, for this, where we're actually doing some exercise while we're in the suit. So we're combining the best of both worlds and hopefully save uh, the amount of pre-breathe time, the amount of oxygen that we're, that we're using, which is a consumable. Every, every molecule of oxygen we have to bring up with us in one form or another up into space. So uh, this way we're gonna save our time, save our oxygen, and still be just as safe. And uh, so the science, medical science, continues to amaze me. So the, uh, the, te the tryout of this new procedure comes as you get ready for spacewalk number three. What are you and Drew going to do outside on that adventure? Well, we're, uh, it's amazing what uh, the Canadian uh, robot arm, Canada arm number two, can do aboard the International Space Station. It, uh, it, uh, both ends uh, are fully functional so that uh, and, and not stationary so you can actually inchworm across the space station we have a little train for it so we can put the, the arm can grab onto to a, a grapple fixture and then the other end can grab onto a grapple fixture the arm moves back and forth up and down the truss it's uh, really amazing it, it's a incredible crane that we need to, to help build the space station well the problem is the truss uh, ends at a certain spot and we can only reach to some parts of the space station we can't reach to the other parts, especially the Russian parts. Well, uh, some uh, really smart engineers on the Russian side and American side said, yeah, well, we can just put a grapple fixture out at the right on the FGB, which is the functional cargo block, which is pretty much where the American and Russian parts of the space station meet. And then we can actually reach out and help, help our Russian partners with uh, new modules and extend our reach of our, of our, our robot arm. So Drew and I are uh, going to go out and uh, uh, take uh, payload, uh, excuse me, power data and grapple fixture PDGF, and uh, install it on the outside of the of the functional cargo block, the FGB. And uh, compared to our other spacewalks, this is just going out the door and and uh, moving along outside for a very short period of you know, very short distance. Uh, but it's a, a PDGFs are, are very big. So we're going to actually 
tend it between us because there's no weight, right? So we're going to float it between us, make sure it doesn't float away. We'll have some tethers on it and uh, take it to the outside of the FGB and bolt it down. And uh, then the tough part is for the power and data. So we have to connect the power and data lines, uh, long cables, back to the American uh, segment and node one in the lab. So it's going to be uh, pretty, pretty exciting to do that. It's going to be a shorter spacewalk, I think, uh, in terms of complexity, but its importance to the space station, I think, is, uh, is going to be shown in the future when, we're, when the Canada arm you know, is, uh, is helping out on you know, touching things on the service module. That's amazing. Now, the, this third EVA was a relatively late addition to your flight. What were the circumstances on orbit that forced this job onto STS-134? Well, the expedition crew aboard the International Space Station last summer uh, was getting ready to do the exact same spacewalk, but then uh, right before they were about to go out the door, one of the uh, pump modules for our space station air conditioning system went out. So we sent uh, Doug Wheelock and, and Tracy Caldwell outside with Shannon Walker running the robot arm inside, and uh, they were able to save the space station and uh, make that major repair in real time. Well, unfortunately, Doug and, and uh, Tracy didn't have a chance to, to do the original spacewalk that they were planning for. And so what we were able to do is extend our mission and uh, complete this uh, task. So, because we had time in our training schedule and a uh, chance to, to, to you know, fit right into our schedule. So we were able to do that. Then the fourth spacewalk uh, is for you and Greg to uh, go outside. Uh, what's on the schedule for this last planned spacewalk? And in particular, uh, you're leaving the orbital boom sensor system behind. Well, my previous spacewalks uh, on this mission, uh, you know, I'll be going out with one of Hubble's finest, you know, Drew Foistel, uh, who's an experienced spacewalker for sure, and uh, our lead spacewalker. But uh, Greg and I, we'd, f we'd flown together before for months aboard the International Space Station and I was always, I knew that was one of his dreams to go out on a spacewalk. Little did I dream that I'd be going out on a spacewalk with him for his second spacewalk. So I'm excited about this. The OBSS, Orbiter Boom Sensor System, we're going to be focusing on the boom part. And uh, most people can remember the excitement we had a few years ago when we were, were extending a, a solar array and it ripped. And uh, we sent Scott Parazinski way out on a solar array, which is far away from the space st st truss structure, on not just a robot arm, but the robot arm was holding this long boom, kind of a stick. And uh, then Scott was at the end of the stick, and we were kind of moving the arm out so he could work on the, uh, the solar array. And uh, we had some pretty insightful managers saying, hey, you know, that, that boom system is not just good for examining the outside of the space shuttle, so doing the inspection so we can come home safely. Uh, but maybe it's also good for the space station. So when the shuttle program is uh, is ending, they're they're saying, well, you know, hey, uh, you need one of those that boom thing that you're carrying around. You mind if we keep it? And the uh, shuttle guy said, well, uh, we're not going to need it. So so we made provisions to leave it aboard uh, the International Space Station, and uh, we have to do some surgery on it. And that's where Dr. Shamatov comes and uh, will will shine the most uh, because we have a several different kind of grapple fixtures. Well, we have a shuttle arm based grapple fixture, which is kind of small. And then we have the larger uh, Canada arm two kind of grapple fixture. So we're going to, uh, once we get the boom uh, on these uh, racks on the outside, on the truss of the space station, it's gonna sit right there proudly on the front top of the, of the truss of the space station. And uh, once, once that's set, then we're going to go get another big payload data grapple fixture. I don't know why I'm carrying so many of these on this mission, but uh, we're going to get another uh, large grapple fixture, and uh, we're going to uh, carefully unbolt the one that's up there, the shuttle-based one. Uh, we're gonna, actually, they're going to let us use scissors on this mission. <laughs> <laughs> Space scissors. Well, you have to be careful because you don't want to cut your suit. That would be bad. So we actually, I get to hand Dr. Shamatov the scissors, and he's going to carefully cut the the, the cord that the electrical power cord um, off of off of the shuttle base grapple fixture we're going to put in the big uh, and then bolt on the the big uh, station base so now the station arm could be able to grapple uh, this boom not just at the end but uh, not just at the middle but also at the end and extend our reach so someday we don't know when we're going to need it 
but someday it may be very useful to have a, this, this extra reach uh, for our arm to help uh, repair the space station. You never know what, uh, what's going to happen. And all that's going to be after the shuttle is done using it for the inspection. Sure. So that's why it's our last, uh, our last spacewalk. So uh, right before our last spacewalk, we're going to use the boom to inspect our Endeavor, uh, the thermal control system, so that we, uh, so we can come home safely. Once we're sure that uh, we have a nice clean inspection, then we're going to uh, put the boom on the station the next, very next day and leave a couple days later. During the rendezvous and docking on your arrival, but then again during the undocking and the fly around, you're going to be gathering data for a development test objective that's known as STORM, which stands for Sensor Test for Orion Relative Navigation Risk Mitigation. Now, this includes something brand new. This the shuttle is going to re-rendezvous with the station after it flies away. Fill us in on what this uh, what this test is about and 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 how you're going to go about gathering the data. Well, one of the most uh, complex things to do with uh, in, in space flight is uh, the whole orbital dynamics because you're going 17,500 miles an hour around the planet and you're trying to catch up with, with another thing that's going 17,500 miles an hour. You want to make sure you get the orbits just right because orbits aren't perfectly circular and it's a, it's a real trick and it's, a, and it's really high technology and, and being able to dock with things in space was one of the things that we ha uh, had to prove to ourselves in the Gemini program. Uh, that was one of the major missions. So now we still do it, but it doesn't mean it's not difficult. So uh, each and every system that we have, I mean, we've used several aboard the space shuttle. The uh, Russians have had to evolve their, uh, their system called CORS uh, to be able to, to have these rendezvous. Well, with Orion and future space vehicles, we're actually uh, putting the next level of technology, the next level of sensors uh, into play so that we have something that's lighter, uh, more capable, and uh, costs less power and, uh, and, and energy to, to run, and yet puts us exactly where we need to be in space at the right time for rendezvous. So we're carrying those sensors aboard with us. And uh, so for our first rendezvous, it's important. Um, so we're going to rendezvous the shuttle style and we've gotten that down pat. Uh, we have some, um, an amazing team that, um, that runs rendezvous all the way from training to, to rendezvous with all the different sensors that we use for shuttle. But those sensors are big. We uh, have to do a lot of work as, uh, as crew members to integrate them all, but it works, it works great. So we're gonna not mess with success. We're gonna do a normal docking with the normal shuttle, uh, with the normal shuttle uh, systems. Storm will be there watching. So Drew's going to be at the Storm laptop, making sure that Storm is seeing everything. And so the, the engineers and the scientists on the ground are going to be able to get some good data from that. But then, at the end of the mission, since we've already docked with the space station, got all of our objectives out of the way, did there what, uh, what we came to do, then we're going to come back and we're going to rendezvous in a different way. We're going to come and rendezvous kind of the Apollo style you know, the old-fashioned way, but which is great for capsules. And for our next uh, spacecraft, it's going to be more of a rendezvous that, that, that way. So uh, we have the, the storm is going to be helping lead us, and uh, we, we'll use the shuttle sensors more as a, of a backup, and we'll see where storm takes us. And it'll get some great data, some really good practical operations, not just for the, the sensors, but for the team on the ground so that we're ready for the next, for the next spacecraft when it comes. Now, STS-134 is the last flight of Shuttle Endeavour. Now, apart from Endeavour being the shuttle that you fly on, where do you, what do you see this ship's place being in the history of human spaceflight? Well, I take a, a long view of, of what we've done so far and, and where we're going. I firmly believe that, uh, that uh, human beings will not stay long on planet Earth and that there's a whole universe out there to explore. And we're going to send people back to the moon. We're going to have colonies on the moon. We're going to go to Mars. And boy, I can't wait to, to learn someday that, that uh, we have uh, human beings around other, other, in older, other solar systems. It might be pie in the sky, but uh, you know, our population is already six billion on this planet and there's just going to be a lot of demand for more room. And uh, and we got the technology, and uh, we have the 
the resources, and there's so many amazing resources out there in space on the moon, for example, that haven't been tapped and that will not hurt the environment and, and uh, won't hurt other people. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a, a major change in, in what human beings are doing. So a really small piece of that story is, is going to be you know, the Endeavour's last mission. But uh, the space shuttle program, I think, will definitely be remembered for the amazing things that, it's, that it has done. Having come from a capsule background with the Soyuz, which uh, if you all remember Apollo Soyuz, they're roughly comparable vehicles, capsule-based technology. Space shuttle is just absolutely amazing in terms of uh, what it can do, how, much, how many people it can take up, how much cargo, I mean, it, and, and the complexity that it had, especially for its time. Uh, you know, fly-by-wire systems, all these things we take for granted today, you know, 30 or 40 years later in our airplanes. Well, the space shuttle was among the first to do, and it did, and did well. The space shuttle also built, you know, humanity's uh, first outpost to the stars, the International Space Station. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great legacy. And the, everything that we've learned along the way, all the technology, all of the science that we've been, bring, that we've been able to bring in in these past years, with the space shuttle, I think uh, is going to be is going to be remembered very nicely in in the history books. You're going to be flying this mission right around the 50th anniversary of the first human space flight by Yuri Gagarin, which is also the 30th anniversary of the first space shuttle flight. Uh, right around the 50th anniversary of the first American space flight by Alan Shepard. What are your thoughts about you being in space at the time that we're all? thinking about these historic events? It's, um, it's humbling because I was, you know, when I was growing up, I was watching people walk on the moon and I looked and said, wow, that's something I really want to do. And to actually be part of the space program, especially on a historical mission like we are, uh, it's just, uh, I could never have imagined that that would, that I'd be there. So when I'm up there, I, I, I think it's gonna, it's gonna hit me pretty hard. It, we'll got to focus on the mission and we'll get our job done. But there might be a few moments where I'm probably out there looking out the window saying, my goodness. Well, we've come an awful long way in that 50 years from Yuri Gagarin's capsule to the International Space Station. How much farther do you think we're going to go in the, in the 50 years ahead of us? The sky's the limit. And I really hope uh, our country uh, understands the, the value of exploration and, uh, and the value of the unknown that we that uh, that's out there I mean it's a, I've had the blessing of being able to be in space for a whole year of my life you know 10 percent of the space station's lifetime I've been there and I've had a chance to reflect and look how big the universe is and how small our planet is and looking saying wow my goodness why are we fighting down here when we could be exploring and finding new things and making uh, life better for human beings and uh, as well as the the, the, the principles that we stand for in the United States uh, in terms of, of democracy and, and individual freedoms and rights, heck, that's uh, something I think that would be good for the rest of the solar system too.